I, I, I'd like to first of all thank Andy and, and, and John for putting up such, such an interesting meeting and thank Mike for, for fantastic talks. When I arrived yesterday, I looked at the list of, of abstracts and read them and I sort of stopped at one which, which was I incoherent and then I realized it, it's, it's my own. <laughs> and, and, that, and, and that was a, a, a problem with, on my part with copying and, and, and pasting before I sent it to the organizers. <laughs> This is uh, going to be joint, joint work with, with Paul Todd from, from Oxford, and it's, you know, the theme is how to recognize a, um, a Keller metric in a conformal class. But what, what, what I'll do before I tell you about this problem is I, um, some other problems which I refer to as can you find type questions to motivate it. So here is, is you know, the setup is this: you have a Riemannian, Riemannian four manifold, but but really I'll be mostly talking about local issues. So you can think of M as an open set in R four, and um, can you find a non-zero function on M such that? So so, whoops. Question one is such that a conformally rescaled metric omega square times g is flat. How can you tell, given a metric in, in some coordinate system? Well, the answer to that is you need the Val curvature to, to vanish. And just, just, to, just to recall, you have this curvature decomposition of a Riemann tensor into Val, Ricci, and you, you might separate scalar too. And Val is the one which is um, totally trace free. Now, you should know, this is not obvious. This, this is something which needs the proof. I mean, it. it the, the, the proof is within everybody's reach, but it doesn't follow from definition of Val tensor that, that that needs to be the case, but this is the case. So Val curvature controls the conformal flatness. It's the obstruction, if you like, to, uh, to, 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 to having a conformally flat metric. Well, next question. So, so can you find that there exists an algorithm? Well, no. Uh, to, to, for me, it means, is there an algorithm? Be, you know, if, if, if there is an algorithm of determining whether there exists one, you can tell whether it exists or not. I mean, generically, it's not true. Not every metric is conformal to a flat metric. Right, uh, but if something doesn't like you, can't you, uh, uh, on R4, uh, metrics with uh, zero vial curvature, you know an algorithm to... Yes, I give it to a Maple computer and ask it to calculate vial curvature, and it will be zero. Oh, no, I see what you mean. You no. Well, OK, that's a good point. In, in, in what follows, you, you'll see that I will actually be, be producing some expressions for the right conformal factors. But here, at the moment, I just ask, does there exist and can I tell by, by calculating something? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm not, you know. Uh, Good, that's one question. The second question is, can you find an omega such that omega square g is Einstein, right? That, that's a very interesting question, and it's been around since the early days of, of relativity, and a lot is known um, about it. Uh, for some reason, where do I direct it? Oh, good. But, but in, in all honesty, I, I, I believe that the, the, uh, the, the full answer to this question, even in dimension four, even in Riemannian curvature, is still not known. I mean, there are many necessary conditions. There's something called the Bach tensor. There is something called the Eastwood tensor. But, but no, nobody knows, without making big genericity assumption on the curvature, what is the complete set of conformally invariant conditions which will guarantee that your metric is conformal to Einstein. That's a very, very interesting question. The third question is the one I'll be talking about. So can you find a function such that a rescaled metric is scalar? So what, what, what does that mean? Well, there are many definitions, and if you're, the, the one I'm going to use is this. You, you have a, a complex structure that is an integrable, well, an endomorphism with squares of, of a tangent bundle of squares to minus one, and such that the um, eigenspaces of the co complexified tangent bundle to your manifold are Frobenius integrable. So the possible eigenvalues are i and minus i, and so you have two 
eigenspaces and you want any of them to be integrable. So that's what you want. Uh, you, you, you want then this endomorphism to be Hermitian, so a metric to be compatible with your endomorphism in, in this way. And finally, you, you define a fundamental two-form by sort of lowering an index using the metric and, and J, and you want it to be closed. That, that's, that's one definition of what the Kähler metric is. Right? So, but, but in your problem, you're not given this complex structure J. All you're given is, is a local formula for the metric, and you want to know whether such J exists. So that, that's the problem I'll be um, discussing. Now, um, so, so let, let, let's try to answer it. Well, you, you might want to make a guess. Perhaps always, perhaps the, for any given metric, there is an omega such that omega squared G is scalar. So it, it, it's not true. It doesn't always exist. And you can, you can, you can do it by a fairly naive numerology, uh, counting the, the, the arbitrary functions. So let's do that. Um, if, you, if you start with a metric in 2n dimensions, and this metric is a symmetric 2n by 2n matrix. So it depends, whoops, depends on that many arbitrary functions of 2n variables. Now you can use the diffeomorphism freedom, that is, you can sort of change coordinates to get rid of 2n functions out of these numbers. But you also, because we're looking for the conformal to Kähler conditions, you also can conformally rescale the metric. So that, again, takes away one function, and you're left with this number. So th this is the number of functions a conformal class in even dimension depends on. Now take a Kähler metric. Well, a Kähler metric locally can be described in terms of one function. It's called Kähler potential. So if, if you have, you have the hol holomorphic coordinate system, the z's and the z-bars, and you take arbitrary real-valued function, arbitrary one, of, of z's and z-bars, you write the following expression, that is, that metric is scalar, and locally every Kähler metric is, is of this form. Now, there is some freedom in this function k, but it's measured by functions of um, smaller number of variables. So, so morally speaking, a Kähler metric depends on one function of 2n variables. So you have 1 versus 2n squared minus n minus 1. Well, y y yes. Yeah, so I've, you know, if, 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 if I have a Kähler metric, I've, I've, I, th there exists some complex. Uh, right, but the function k. Uh, I well, listen, I, I, I'm not going to formulate any theorems using this. In, in fact, it would be quite, quite wrong for me to do so. All I want you to do is convince you that it, it's a very non-generic. Huh? So, so 2n squared minus n minus 1 and so roughly 1 modulo discussion. Now, you take a difference between these two numbers, and you find that it's this. And that is positive if m is greater than 1. Now, if m is equal to 1, uh, that number is actually negative. So, so but, but what, what that means is you, you didn't need to rescale conformally because any metric in two dimensions, you can use the orientation to give you a rotation by 90 degrees, and any metric will actually be Kähler, locally Kähler. But if n is greater than 1, so say n is 2, then this number is already 5, and this number is 1. So we expect conditions and obstructions, and you want to express these obstructions in terms of conformally invariant tensors, in the same way the vial tensor obstructs the existence of the flat metric, right? And th that's all you learn from this numerology. I mean, the, the, the fact that you have five conditions and not one it does not at all mean that you should expect four obstructions, right? All that tells you is that one is bigger than the other. So le let me summarize the, the, the results in, in dimension four. What, 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 what happens is this you'll find that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between Kähler metrics in a conformal class and, and covariantly constant sections of, of, of certain um, vector bundle over your, your four manifold. This is a rank 10 vector bundle. And it's given by a direct sum of the bundle of self-dual two forms, one forms, and anti-self-dual two forms. If um, certain genericity conditions on the curvature are uh, 
to have assumed, technically speaking, if the valid tensor is not self-dual, then you can find a very satisfactory answer. You find necessary and sufficient condition for existence of the Kähler metric, and they oops, are expressed as um, you know, they're not quite tensors, they, 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 let's call them spinners. They, you, you have a section of this kind of bundle, S tensor symmetric fifth power of S prime. Mike talked about these bundles a, a, a bit, I mean, at the last lecture. That has to vanish. And there is also a one form which needs to be closed. And um, both the one form and T depend on the, the self-dual val tensor and its covariant derivative. And um, these two conditions are conformally invariant. In fact, they conformally invariant and without a conformal weight. They, 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 they weight. What S prime? What S prime? I'll, I'll be defining it in a moment. That, that, that's a primed spin bundle. Now, uh, if the val tensor is self-dual, then these conditions vanish identically, so they don't do you much good. But then you, you, you can find some necessary conditions I mean, in principle, you could do it all, but we, we, we weren't able to. You could find some necessary conditions from the holonomy of these associated prolongation connections. And you can, you, you can deduce some kind of results. For example, that an anti self dual Einstein metric is conformal to a Kähler metric, even only if there exists a, well, a killing vector, I should say. Th th these are the results. Um, and th there is a, a rather surprising link with, with another problem, not concerning Kähler geometry, but projective differential geometry. It, it turns out, and if I have time, I'll tell you about it, that a, called a projective structure in, in, on, on a surface comes from a, comes from a metric if and only if certain canonically induced conformal structure, well, in signature 2.2, um, on the tangent bundle admits a Kähler metric or what's called a para-Kähler metric in the conformal class. That, that I mean, it's a very it's an interesting link in, in the context of this meeting. Now, is it a trick or what? So, so um, I, I'll, um, I'll work in four dimensions and the methods we, we employed only work in, in four dimensions and they based on two ingredients. One is called self-duality, another one is called spinners. So self-duality first. If you have an oriented four-manifold, there is a there is a Hodge isomorphism be between the space of two forms and the space of two forms, given by metric and the orientation, and um, it squares to plus identity, and it decomposes the space of two forms, which is dimension six, into self-dual and anti-self-dual two forms. And now you, you can, you know, if you write down a Riemann tensor with four indices, it, it's anti-symmetric with respect to the first and the last pair of indices. So you can think about it as a, as a map on the space of two forms, and you can decompose it with respect to the splitting of the space of two forms into the self-dual and anti-self-dual part. So you have to sort of block the composition, and then you sort of recognize or give names to ingredients in different blocks. So the off-diagonal one is the traceless, trace-free Ricci curvature. And on the diagonal, you have self-dual and anti-self-dual val tensors plus a bit of, of Ricci scalar. Right? Now, so that, that's self-duality. Now spinners, well, again, in, in, the, 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 there is an isomorphism between a complexified tangent tangent space at the point, and the tensor product of two vector spaces, you can extend it to two vector bundles. Um, so, so both S and S prime are two complex dimensional at the point vector spaces, which come equipped with symplectic structures, which I'm going to call epsilon and, and, and epsilon prime. Now these, um, these symplectic structures on S and S prime actually give rise to to, to, to well, a metric or conformal structure, because what you do is you, I mean, not every vector or complexified vector is a product of two spinners, one from S, one from S prime, but every vector is a linear combination of such products. So by linearity, it, it's enough to define what you mean by a metric on, um, um, on this pure product, and th that's how you do it. So, so roughly speaking, G is epsilon tensor, epsilon prime. 
Now, um, now, and this is the kind of time when you introduce spinner notation. And as, as Mike says, all you, well, you can think of these spinner indices, and there'll be many of them, merely as a way of labeling um, which bundles you're dealing with. So if, you know, if, if I write um, mu a, that, that is just a section of, um, of s, and mu a prime will be a section of s a prime, and so on. The epsilons, the symplectic structures, give you isomorphisms between the spin bundles and their duals, and you use them to lower and raise indices. And when you do that, you have to be careful about the order in which you do it. So th these are the conventions. If you're not careful, you have your signs wrong. Now, th there is a connection between spinners and self-duality, and the connection is this. If you, if you take a two-form, uh, you can, and, and you can think of it in, in terms of the spinner indices, spinner decomposition, which we extend to the bundle of two forms, um, you find that it decomposes into self-dual and anti-self-dual, well, self-dual and anti-self-dual parts, and the self-dual part is given by a symmetric two-primed spinner, and the anti-self-dual part is given by another spinner. So you really, here you're sort of establishing an isomorphism between the space of self-dual two forms and the symmetric second power of, 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 of S prime, et cetera. And the last thing in the, this theme is there is now a, a long and nasty formula for what happens if you take the curvature and you decompose it into irreducible parts using these spinners. And again, that's, you know, you know all, 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 the, all the spinners I write except the epsilons are symmetric in their indices. So this is an irreducible decomposition. Now, um, what does it have to do with this Kähler, conformal to Kähler problem? Well, you have a, a complex structure, squares to minus one. You write down the corresponding two form, and you find that this algebraic condition on the complex structure implies that this two form has to be self-dual or anti-self-dual. And now you make a choice. You, you choose it to be self-dual. That's a kind of convention people use so that it is self-dual with respect to the orientation given by the square of this form. Right? As if it's self-dual, it, it, no, it, it only has one term in, in this decomposition, given by a section of S prime tensor and S prime. And um, now you look at how, how things behave under conformal rescalings. The, the, the conformal weights I attach to things are slightly non-standard. I'd like to skip over it for the time being, but it, it'll, make, it'll make the, the equations I'm going to write down conformally invariant. Well, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's how the metric scales. That's how sigma scales. That is the, the non-standard bit. And so if, if you combine this with this, you find that this little omega has weight two. And then you, you, you find, and that's really what makes it work, you find that the metric is conformal to a Kähler metric if and only if there exists a real symmetric spinner field omega, which satisfies what's called the twister equation. And the, kind of the index free way of writing this twister equation is, is this. So, um, and, and it has to be non-degenerate in the sense that it has a non-zero non length. Now, this, this equation with, with this chosen, that's very important, with this chosen weight is conformally invariant. And the idea is by, by, by now a familiar one after Mike's lecture. So we want to you know, prolong it and look for integrability conditions. Uh, uh, p p people would call it, I think, rank two killing spinner. Yes, but this, um, yes. Now, now so let, let's look at this equation for, for a moment, you see. On one hand, it's an overdetermined equation because it has more, um, that's right, it has more equations than unknowns. There are only three unknowns and the omega, or the omegas, and, and many equations. On the other hand, it's not overdetermined enough because this equation does not specify the values of all first derivatives of omega at the point. So what you do is you, you follow this procedure Mike explained yesterday, the prolongation procedure. And this is, I'm, I, I'll go through it. But essentially what you do is you um, determine your system by adding more and more variables. 
and you do it as long as, as, as you have to, so, so, I mean, so that you have a closed system. I mean, it, it's, not, it, it's not the case that for any, any kind of system you start prolonging, you will end up with a closed system. But, but this, this system I'm talking about, yes? Uh, this, this is a, this is a, a, a levy trivita connection acting on spin bundles, right? So, so it's, it's induced by the metric. So, so th this belongs to the class of systems of finite type where this prolongation sort of will terminate, right? So let, let's do it. Start with this equation. The first thing you do is drop the symmetrizations. And if you drop the symmetrizations, this is just equivalent to this equation, except that k, you know, one form k comes out of the blue. And, um, and, and you don't know how to specify the derivatives of k. So what you do is you differentiate this equation and you commute the derivatives, the second derivatives on omega, and that will introduce curvature. And that will tell you what the derivatives of k are. So you, you, you've done it once. And you get two things. First thing you get is an algebraic obstruction of this sort on the self-dual Val tensor. And the second thing you get is, a, um, is an equation for a derivative of k. And here, the, 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 the row tensor of conformal geometry make, you know, ap appears. But you also need to introduce another, another object. This time it's, a self, it's an anti-self-dual two-form, uh, which makes this equation equivalent to this equation, to the derivative of this equation. So you haven't, you know, you, you have to differentiate one more to find what the derivative of rho is. So you do it. And now um, the formula gets more complicated, involves derivatives of the val spinner and, and the rho tensor and whatnot. But the good thing is you don't need to introduce any more unknown. So at this stage you have finished your prolongation process. And all derivatives of the unknowns, which is the rho, the k, and the omega, are determined in terms of the unknowns. Another better geometric interpretation of what you've done is, is as follows. Think of these blue equations, also the, 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 the left-hand sides of the blue equations, as determining a connection on a rank 10 vector bundle. And this vector bundle is a direct sum of these bundles. That one corresponds to omega. This corresponds to k. And this one corresponds to rho. Um, and um, and so, so, so what for this conformal to Kähler problem, we need a section of this bundle which is parallel with respect to the connection defined by the prolongation procedure. I, I'll be calling this connection a prolongation connection. In fact, th th those of you who, who know about tractors will, 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 will no doubt see that it, it, it's related to a, you know, the, the, the bundle which, um, the, 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 the vector bundle on which my connection is defined is related to a, a third anti-symmetric power of the usual tractor bundle. So you take, you take the, 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 free f the, 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 the tractor free forms, which are self-dual, but, but, but if, if you do that, and if you, if you take the induced connection on this bundle of tractor free forms, you find that it's different than the one I'm, I'm using, unless you're in the conformally flat case. I, th I think Daniel Storczyk, will be, who will be talking after me, has, you know, has a very good kind of point of view of how all these connections are, are, are related. I, um, I myself don't. Now, um, so, so this is just the one transparency which serves as a warning. Right? But you, you should really keep in mind that you work with a local problem rather than a global one. So, so I'm, I, I'm trying to convince you here that even if all these obstructions um, are, are satisfied, you still uh, will not necessarily have a Kähler metric in your conformal class globally. And the example is this. You take a, a compact hyperbolic manifold. So um, it, it is constant curvature. And the Val curvature is 0. So it's conformally flat. So all the obstructions vanish because they conformally invariant. And the only piece of curvature which is not 0 is the Ricci scalar, which is minus 1. And all local obstructions to this existence of sections will vanish identically. Now, let's, let's therefore assume that there exists a globally defined non-degenerate um, omega, omega a prime b prime, which satisfies the twister equation. Now, this 
This omega, and that, that's important, this omega cannot be covariantly constant because if it was, the metric would already be scalar, but if it was scalar and until self dual, it would have to be scalar flat. But the scalar curvature is not zero. So omega assuming satisfies twister equation, but is not parallel. If it's not parallel, then you look back here and you see that it, it defines a vector, a one form, and this one form in this case is a, is a killing vector. So you have a killing vector. So now what you do is you take a standard identity for killing vectors, that the, a second derivative of a killing vector is a curvature times a killing vector. And you, you, you take a trace on, 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 on the pair of differential operators that gives you this identity. Um, and now you contract this identity with, with, with a dual of k and you integrate by parts. So this is the kind of Bochner time argument. And you find that on the left hand side you have you have this non-negative expression. On the right-hand side, you have a negative expression or non-positive expression. And the only way out, the only way this can be satisfied is if k is zero. But uh, no, we, we thought it's not zero. So what goes wrong? Well, our assumption is wrong. There does not exist omega which satisfies, which satisfies the twister equation. So um, how, how, do you, how do you interpret that in terms of your connection? Well, you have a connection which is flat, so it, it has a maximal number of parallel sections, which in this case is 10, but this connection has a non-trivial monodromy around some singularities of omega. So, so you know, we, we really, um, the global, global issues are of different nature. Now, um, put that aside, come back to the local problem, work with the generic case first, where the self-dual curvature um, is not zero. So recall that the first thing we got from our prolongation procedure, from differentiating, um, differentiating the twister equation, was this algebraic constraint relating the, the, the Val spinner to, um, to, to this solution to the twister equation. So you're, you're play with that a bit, and you find, and that, that's an algebraic kind of state calculation, you find that, uh, that the self-dual Val spinner is what was called type D. So you see, if, if you have a section of a symmetric fourth power of, of a rank two bundle, that is nothing but a quartic, a, 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 a homogeneous polynomial of two variables of degree four. So you will have four roots, and you can you can then classify you can classify your object by looking at positions of these roots, and this is known as a petrov penrose classification. And and one possibility is what's referred to as type D where you have two repeated roots. So you have a pair of roots which is repeated. And so you find that that's what happens. And moreover, you find that the pair of these roots is given by the roots of omega. So th this, this formula holds for plus or minus sign. Now you differentiate your algebraic constraint, keeping that in mind. And you know, with some calculation, you find the following. You find that as a, in integrability conditions for this the, the derivatives are that uh, the, the following two objects vanish. So maybe let me start from the second. First of all, there is a one form V given by the norm of the self-dual valve spinner and the derivative of this norm and something else. And this has to be, see, this is not conformally invariant. Th this transform as what we call a Maxwell field. So if, if you change metric conformally, this V picks um, four times what Mike calls epsilon, so, so you know a derivative, a logarithmic derivative of omega. But this condition, d v equals zero, is conformally invariant, and you also find that this has to be zero, uh, where v is given by this expression. So this, is, uh, local. this is a local fear, but this is I, I think this is a good one because th this really is if and only if statement. If, if that happens, find a candidate. Now. The, the, the non-generic case, the anti-self-dual case, well, you know, th this expression is not helpful because v and psi uh, are zero. So what you do instead is you, well, you, you look at the conditions for, for this prolongation connection to admit parallel sections. And generically, it won't admit any parallel sections. On the other extreme is it lacks, admit a maximal number of parallel sections, which is 10. If it admits 10 parallel sections, it has to be flat. 
Otherwise, take the equation d psi equals zero, where psi is your section, and, and differentiate it, and use it again, and you find, and here I'm skipping a lot of indices, you find that the curvature of this connection times psi has to be zero. And that's an algebraic system of equations on psi. Now, there are 10 unknowns in psi, but the curvature of this connection you find is so that this equation only gives you five equations. So you have five algebraic equations for 10 unknowns, they're homogeneous, that's all right. I mean, you, you still can have solutions. So what you do is you carry on differentiating. You differentiate once more, and that gives you many equations. Or already this condition gives you more equations than you need. Uh, I mean, it gives you more than 10 equations in total. But you keep differentiating, and eventually you stop. And you stop if after k steps, and taking k as derivative doesn't add any more equations to your system. Then, then the subsequent differentiations won't add any equations either. And now what you do is you look at the, um, you look at the matrix, which I'm calling FK. That's a matrix of all equations you've obtained from F and its, 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 its derivatives. And you calculate the rank of this matrix. And, um, and if, if, if the rank of this matrix is, um, is 10, you will not have any parallel sections because you have 10 independent equations on, on, on 10 unknowns and the only solution is a zero solution. And otherwise, uh, the space of parallel sections is 10 minus the rank of this, um, of this matrix. So you might have you know, one Kähler metric in the conformal class, but you can have more Kähler metrics in the conformal class. Okay. Now, um, so, so that there's some kind of spin-offs from these this calculations. For example, what, what you, as, as I said already, what you, what you can show is that if, if you have, if, if your conformal class not only co contains a Kähler metric, but also contains an Einstein metric um, with non-zero rich scalar, then that can happen if and only if your metric admits an isometry. Okay? So, so, and, and, and you can construct examples with Einstein or what's called hyperhermitian, which is actually not conformally Kähler. Now, uh, but, but this example is kind of a, a, a good one, so I'm, I'm skipping some details, but, but this prolongation procedure, knowing K, really tells you what the conformal factor has to be to make your metric Kähler. So if you, for example, take a Fubini study with, with a reversed orientation, now that is, uh, that is Einstein, that is anti-self-dual, and that has many symmetries, and you can pick any of these symmetries and use it to construct a conformal factor, so you can find that locally CP2 is scalar uh, in many ways. And in fact, this has to do with this killing Tensors. I mean, they, um, you know, th th these other Kähler forms give rise to killing tensors for CP2. Um, why? Right. Okay. So, so now this. Th 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 let's start again. A new problem. Um, I mean, connection to this mesh visibility problem in dimension two. So, so I, I, I just define. See a. a, 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 a Projective structure, I mean, a priori, this doesn't have anything to do with what I told you about so far. It's a start as a new, 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 new kind of transparency. You, you take an open set in R2, and you define the projective structure to be an equivalence class of, of torsion-free connections. And you say that two connections are equivalent if they share the same unparametrized... So do you want to ask a question? No. Sorry. If, if, if they share the same unparametrized geodesics. Now, what this means, so say you have two connections and you can lift both connections to the total space of, um, of the tangent bundle, so you get two geodesic sprays. So for, for that to happen, you want this geodesic sprays to have the same projection to the projectivized tangent bundle. And if you do this calculation, you find that there is an analytic expression for this equivalence class. So two connections belong to the same equivalence class if they differ by one form in, in this way, for some one form. Now, um, 
if, if you take, I mean, that's a really old fashioned way of thinking about it, and, and, and Mike will not, will not like it, but anyway. Um, if you take the Christoffel symbols of any of these connections, say this one, and you obviously they, 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 they're meaningless because they change under this transformation. But if you take this combination of Christoffel symbols, and that's due to Tracy Thomas, uh, then because of the factors, you find that uh, this actually doesn't change um, when you change omega. So you, you, you call that projective connection. It's one piece of old mathematics. Uh, there is um, now, now, now what, what um, a couple of years ago, Mike, Robert, Bryant, and my, myself managed to establish a, a criteria. I mean, in this case, it was sufficient and general and necessary conditions for a projective connection to arise from a metric. That is, that the, the problem is this. You're given this projective class. You have a bunch of unparametrized curves, one curve through any point in any directions. How can you tell whether these curves arise as, as geodesics of some metric? And that, you know, that's a natural question to ask, and we, we think it goes back at least to, to Roger Liouville in the 19th century. But we, you know, there, there is a solution now to this, to this problem. Now, a, 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 another disconnected piece of old um, classical differential geometry, which I think goes back to Walker, but also the, the Japanese school, Yano and Ishishara and, and, and others, I mean, he, in a certain sense, this is what, what people refer to here as the ambient metric. But anyway, what, 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 what Walker tells you is, is this. If you take, in any dimension, if you take an affine connection on a, on a, on a tangent bundle, then you can um, leave this affine connection to a metric on the total space of the tangent bundle. So, so this works for any connection. The axes are local coordinates on you. The z's are local coordinates on the fiber. And here comes, well, what I write is a formula for a metric. It really is a co conformal class of metrics, which is associated to these connections. And it, it has, you know, it, it has some remarkable properties. It, it, has an, um, it has a null, it has a null homotopy and, and, and other things. And it, it, it's defined in this case in signature 2, 2. So now, uh, w w what does it have to do with my conformal to Kähler questions? Well, you can, you can take this metric or conformal class which comes from a projective structure and you can say, well, is it conformal to Kähler for some choice of conformal? And what you find is that this metric is conformal to Kähler structure or to a para-Kähler structure. Para-Kähler is there's an acronym you use for your, I mean, in 2-2 two, two signature, you can have situation where what you call J in Kähler geometry squares to plus one and not to minus one. That's called para -Kähler. So it, it squares to one of these, if and only if the projective structure comes from a metric. So it's okay as a theorem. And if, 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 you, if you're thinking in terms of, now the, the, the way we solved this problem was, was again by a prolongation, prolongation procedure and, and the prolongation bundle. So you would think that if, if, if that theorem is true, that prolongation bundles have something in common, you can embed one of them in the other, and that indeed um, is what happens. But so there's this link, and I think there'll be other links. I mean, I think it's an unexplored subject to some extent, the connection between projective geometry on, 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 on some manifold and the conformal geometry on the tangent bundle to this manifold. This is one of the uh, well, examples where, where, where that, that, that is ma ma manifest. So I, I sort of c c c came to an end. Yes. It is true for any dimension. It, it is true for, uh, well, th this, pro this metric makes sense for any dimensions. Mm -hmm. This is not, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't think it is true for any dimensions because, well, primarily because we haven't solved the, the conformal to Kähler problem in any dimensions. So um, I, I'll say something about it. Uh, that is um, that, 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 that is that is right. Uh, however, my, my recollection is if, if you if you take projectively invariant quantities and you start calculating the the, 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 the curvature of this metric, 
then um, project. I, I, I think what you're saying is right. I mean, I, I'd rather think of it as a conformal class, but that, that, that's correct. That is a metric. Yeah, I thank you, Frank. So, so what we've done is conformal to Kähler problem in dimension four leads to an overdetermined system, linear PDEs, and we find a, a, a sufficient and necessary conditions for this system to, um, to, to admit solutions, and that has to do with parallel sections of a prolongation bundle of, of rank 10. So, you know, if, if a bundle of rank 10, this is a n number you, 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 you know what to do with it. <laughs> now, uh, th th there, is, there is another story which I didn't tell you about, so that, that, that's for the experts, this part, you see, really for the experts. The, the curvature of this prolongation connection actually turns, to be, turns out to be self-dual, sorry, anti-self-dual. So, um, I mean, m many of the components vanish. Now, the, the, there is, um, in, in the, in the anti-self-dual case, there is a nice twister theory, which I think we'll hear about this afternoon from Mike, which, which associates a, a twister space to, to, your anti, to, 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 to the conformal structure. So because the prolongation bundle has an anti-self-dual connection, then, then, then by yet another piece of twister theory called word correspondence, you would think that it'll correspond to a, um, a holomorphic vector bundle on the twister space with no connection. And that's what happens. There, there is a rank 10 vector bundle. Sorry, I, I, I blew it. Uh, right, I, I thought this was Anka. Well, the, 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 there, there is a holomorphic vector bundle with no connection over Z. Uh, so that's not a surprise, but that, that is somehow a replacement of the prolongation procedure. If you have this bundle, you can work your way back to the connection. Um, what, what you can find is that this, this holomorphic vector bundle, the word bundle over Z, is actually the same with the second jet of, of, of certain power of the canonical line bundle of the, of the twister space. So you can, I mean, you know, if, if you take a twister point of view, Somehow you don't have to do the prolongation procedure. That the ranks of the bundles will, 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 will come up. Uh, so, so that was for the experts. For, 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 no, non experts. I, I feel this is a good time for me to promote my, my, my elementary text about the subject, which um, you can um, you know consult. And and and, and now, now what else? You see, the natural question is what happens in in higher dimensions. And the, the, the methods we use, these twister self-duality methods, uh, you know, fail because the, 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 no, essentially because there is no self-duality. But there are other things you can do, and, and I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to do these things together with Rod, Rod Gover. There is still a prolongation story. What, what you do is you relate your problem to what's called conformal killing Yano forms or, or conformal killing forms, people call them. And you look for the obstruction theory for this. The, the reason we, we haven't made progress is that um, it, it turns out that you don't, you, 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 so you finish your prolongation procedure, but you don't only want parallel sections. You want parallel sections which satisfy some nonlinear, as important, Nonlinear algebraic constraints, for example, j squared equals minus one. So, the, the, so, so the, there isn't the correspondence between parallel sections of some prolongation bundle and, and your Kähler forms. And so we, we don't really know the way out. I mean, so some, some nonlinear connections or so, so some, um, so some, some new, new faults are needed. It's based to some extent on the work of, of Semelman. And, and the, the very last thing, uh, you know, I. This is really, and, and, and Mike was already you know, was saying that on more than one occasion, it's a general approach to overdetermined systems, conformal to Kähler, conformal to Einstein, you know, killing tensors, what not. You prolong your system, um, construct a connection on the prolongation bundle, and see how the integrability conditions restrict the holonomy of this connection. So you know, there are many other can you find problems which, which can, in principle, be solved. I'll stop here.
eventually will give you an answer. So whether you have nonlinear equations or whatever, I mean, that's, you just have to differentiate your equations. So well, what, what do you mean by an answer? You know? I mean, and I, so you will either get that there are no solutions, or you'll get a count of what the solutions depend upon. Uh, I um, well, so so you, you can get a count, so you can get an upper bound, but that, that's not what I'm after. What, what, what I'm after, maybe I, I didn't make it clear enough. I, I'd like to, you know, in, in the first example, the elementary one. You calculate the val tensor. If it's zero, the metric is conformal to a flat metric. Okay? I, I'd like to have a, a set of tensors like that, like these val tensors, given explicitly, and, and I can you know, calculate them. If they vanish, there is a conformal. If, if they don't, there isn't. Is that the, the theory is just give exactly well, I, I, I don't know how to go about it if, on, on top of the parallel section conditions, there are nonlinear constraints. Right, Be because I, you know, I can get some, I can get something from um, the the holonomy to Ambrose Singer, would not uh, adding equations to my point right? Right. Well, I mean, I, 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 I really don't think so. You would have to look at look at see in 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 this four dimensional case, the way you calculate these obstructions, you have a big matrix, ten by one hundred and twenty. And you look for 10 by 10 minors, you take the terminants. Here, if you have nonlinear constraints, you have to take resultants. And it's, I, I, it's really not easy. I, I don't know how to do it. So you can differentiate, you can add dummy variables, differentiate those constraints, and you're back, say you have many more variables, so you're still back in the, the same situation as previous. Well, I think of nonlinear, well, we can talk about it. I, 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 yeah. Mike? Ah, very interesting. But I mean, so but in the, my question is, in the self dual case, do you have any obstruction yet? Well, 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 well uh, you know, not 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 a nice one. So what we, I mean, we've extended some emails. What what? An actual conformally varying tensor with obstruction. Uh, tensor? No, 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 no. Well, well, no. What what we what we can do is. Well, we, 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 we can take another derivative and we can pick by hand a 10 by 10 minor and take a determinant. We, we, we can do that, but it, it's, not, it's not nice. I mean, I'd like to do better than that. So, so for example, yeah. the Kerr metric got a fair class inside. Well, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. So, so, so the Kerr itself, what well, people call Kerr is, is Lorentzian, but so you have to analytically continue it. And then, I think you do. I mean, what people call Kerr metric normally is. Well, it's a local problem, but but you have to be careful about the signature of of a metric. Kerr metric is the land. Oh, actually. Okay. Well, th this is this is a problem in Riemannian geometry. So so the signature is four zero. But I I I use spinners, but 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 they're different. Yeah yeah, I can use spinners if I'm careful about reality conditions. I'm sure Mike will tell us about it. But, but you, you can take Kerr metric and analytically continue it to Riemannian category, and then you find that it admits this, this, this killing, what they call killing Yano tensor, which in four dimensions will mean that it will admit K, you know, it's conformal to Kähler. Yeah. And can you write down the omega? Write down the omega in that case, yes. Yeah. 